Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Glad for all those who are able to make it out, and I also welcome all you in Facebook land who are joining us online as well. I invite you to open into your bulletins. We're going to look at some announcements this morning, and then I have a little topic of discussion as well. Uh, before I announce it, is the faith is the menu the same? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, faith, family, and food menu is going to be meatloaf, mashed potatoes, corn casserole, salad, Watergate salad. And it's going to be good. And if you don't think it's hard being here through the office hours while they cook all day long, I know they're downstairs toiling away, but Patty and I are upstairs starving to death while they're doing it. So, <laughs> all right. The scholarships are still available. Uh, the, there is one that has passed, but you still have until March 24th for one of them. So if, if you are in the realm of needing f funds for school, Make sure you get your scholarships in quickly. I have to fill out a part as well saying, yes, you go to church here. So, you know, don't don't leave it till the last minute like I would have done if I was in your shoes. Uh, so make sure to get it done this week. So long as Mother Nature allows it, uh, we will start our Gods at War Bible study. Uh, it'll be Tuesdays at six o'clock. And this is a, a Bible study looking at the different things that we can put before God in our lives. Whether we realize it or not, uh, the books are on the table just as you come through the front door. Uh, if you want to join in, you are welcome to. If you want to join in during Zoom, uh, you can do that, but you need to get a hold of me so I know to make sure to get things set up for Zoom. So that, that is a possibility. You'll be able to see everybody. Everybody will be able to see you. It'll be almost just like you're sitting in there. You just won't be able to eat any of the yummy snacks that we bring. That'll be the major downside, but uh, there is that. Uh, don't forget, next Sunday on the 20th, the Lions Club will be having their spaghetti dinner to help raise money to purchase a new food wagon. It'll be at the Danville Fire Department. $10. Do we want to add any more to that? I know who's making the sauce, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be good. <laughs> also what? Danny's making the sauce. Lots of yummy baked goods. Lots of yummy baked goods. Okay, so it gets even better. Eat in or take out. Eat in or take out. Okay, so that's good to know. Uh, the flowers under the cross this morning are in loving memory of Dorothy Hatfield, given by her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And it tells you how much the pastor is paying attention this morning. Uh, <laughs> are we still doing cookies and milk before I not that one? <laughs> Okay, still having cookies and milk after church downstairs. So please join us. And then uh, Thursday at 6 o'clock is the United Methodist Women's Unit Meeting, uh, which will be in the Fellowship Hall at 6 o'clock. Actually, we'll be meeting a little bit early at 5 o'clock to make cinnamon rolls for Shadia. 5 o'clock to make cinnamon rolls. And at 5 o'clock, they help us make cinnamon rolls. Okay. Bring rolling pins. Okay. 5 o'clock. Are there any other announcements? Yeah, we, we will still gather as long as the snow doesn't start back up. We'll still gather this evening at 6 o'clock to continue in Season 2 of The, of the Chosen. Uh, it's it been really good. You can ask Paul, uh, Bob uh, what he feels about the, uh, the dramatic endings that always leave you hanging. He, he'll tell you exactly what you're missing. Good morning. Last week when I made the announcement about having our potluck dinner on the uh, 20th, I wasn't uh, aware that the Danville Lions Club was having its dinner, uh, spaghetti dinner, on the same day. So we're going to move our potluck dinner to the 27th. And I want to encourage everybody to go, if you can, uh, visit the Danville Lions Club. A, it's really good spaghetti. I know that for a fact because I've had their spaghetti before. But uh, again, from 11 to 5, if I'm not mistaken, and it'll be at Danville Fire Department. And ten dollars, eat in or take out, and some really good food. I know our lunch, regular lunch crew is planning on coming out and visiting you guys. And I'm sure if you need to do uh, takeouts, if you want to send a message to Danny or any member of the Lions Club in advance, they'll get that ready for you. Get, just give them a time as to uh, when you might want to pick that up, and they'll have that ready for you. And along the lines of food, I'll just mention that the uh, United the United Methodist men are going to be having a fish fry, if I'm not mistaken, John, before uh, the week before Good Friday, the Friday before Good Friday, is that correct? Right. Friday before Good Friday. Okay. So put that on your calendars as well. Thank you. All right. Any other announcements? 
Danny. On the fish fry, uh, I talked to Ira last Sunday, I think he called me, and he's got all kinds of fish, so we don't have to purchase these fish, I don't think. Oh, okay. So we're good to go on the fish. Amen. Any other announcements? All right, I got to get serious for a moment. There have been decisions in the denomination that I just want to make the church aware of because different news sources are already going crazy. The first thing I will tell you is if you don't read an article that has the seal that says United Methodist News on the bottom of it, then it is nothing more than could be's. That is our official news store, the United Methodist News. So what has officially been decided is we've been trying to decide whether or not we were going to be able to have a general conference this year. General conference is where our denomination as a whole, as in worldwide, come together to make decisions. That's, that's, that is our legal process. Uh, and it was officially decided, I believe, last week to postpone general conference until 2024. The main reason being that uh, they, weren't able, they aren't able to get visas enough in time to get all the, of the delegates here, which means that no decision can be made about anything right now. However, where some decisions were made in 2019 when we had our special general conference, there are a lot of things that have been placed before our jurisdictional conference, our law body, to make decisions on to see what is allowed and what isn't. I'm not going into detail. If we want to have a special time where we can sit down around some coffee and discuss what all this means, that fine. Uh, that's fine. What I want you to know is that there are a lot of people talking a lot of, I'll call it what it is, nonsense right now. Because they don't know what, what's going to happen. They don't know what the outcome of these things will happen. They don't know anything because only our general conference can make these decisions, and that's not going to happen until, th until 2024. So just be careful about what you read because there are already tons of different articles by different news sources assuming a whole bunch of things, and it's not true. So if, as always, if you come across something and you have questions, call me. I'll, I'll, I'll help figure out what's, what's real and what could be. So... Like I said, if it doesn't have the United Methodist News stamp on it, be careful what you read because it's just a could be or an opinion. All right, enough of that. <laughs> I'm gonna invite Victor back up and he's gonna open us with prayer this morning. Me for a word of prayer. Most gracious and glorious Heavenly Father, how good and how right and how just it is to be in your house, God, wherever we are, whether it be here in Madison or just anywhere around the world, to praise you, God, and thank you for who you are, to thank you for every gift, every grace, every blessing that we have already seen today. Praise your mighty name for those things, God. You know the things, God, that we need even before we ask. God, we come to you, as you know, a broken people, every single one of us, God, has something that just God has separated us from you. And God, we just need to bring that to you once and ask your forgiveness. And Lord, from then on, you are closer to us than our next breath. No matter what we go through, you go with us, God. You go before us. God, we just know that the stories, God, in the Old Testament aren't just stories. God, there are examples of what you did for your people then for what you do for your people now. God, as you led the Israelites out of Egypt, God, you still go for us and you fight our battles for us, God. And we praise you for those things. We thank you. But Heavenly Father, you know that the world is still broken and God, there's just so much going on, so much pain, so much suffering. That Father, we know that you sent Jesus Christ to come into our hearts and minds into this world to give us the example that we needed, God, to become, Lord, your people. It is only through Jesus, God, that we can approach you, and we thank you for that ultimate gift. And Heavenly Father, this world is still so broken, but God, we can be the people that you want us to be. <laughs> but Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for everything. But we pray, God, for especially the people of Ukraine, God, that, that this war come to an end. God, there are wars all over the world going on right now, but Lord, we ask you to 
intervene not only in that situation, but God in all conflict everywhere to end it, God. Heavenly Father, we just praise you above all else and thank you. We praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' most holy and precious name, amen. <laughs> that's that's the operating clear. system. <laughs> that's the operating system saying, "Hurry up!" That's going to get clipped and put on Facebook. <laughs> All right, I invite you to stand as we sing our opening hymn, Rock of Ages, page 361. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4. <laughs> Microphones. Who has a testimony for us this morning? How, how's the Lord been blessing you? I won. My family's had a very blessed week this week, and I just want to give God all the glory for that. We've had lots of blessings. Um, Kevin signed to kick um, football at Concord, and Jane's cheer team did excellent at their competition and got second but the most important blessing that we got and I want to back up and tell a little bit of a history about it um, when we first moved back from Alabama we rented um, a house and the house got sold and we had 30 days to get out and so we had lots of leads of different places but nothing ever seemed to pan out um, and we were starting to run out of time, and I was getting ready for church one morning, and I thought, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. And I thought, I keep saying it's going to be okay, but I haven't actually prayed about it. So I said just a little simple prayer, like, Lord, put this in your hands, guide us to the right house. And about 30 minutes later, my phone rang, and it was Joya, and um, Bill and Judy had gotten a message about a house that they had and um, they were going to bring a key and let us look at their house. They had a house for sale. So after church we went and we looked at this house and it was perfect and they said that we could rent it and that's where we've lived for the past almost 10 years and um, on Friday that house became our forever home. So um, we don't ever have to move and that's really, I'm sorry, <laughs> It's really important to me because I've never had a house even as a little girl I always rented we were very poor growing up and so it's my first time ever having a house of my own and I'm just so thankful for the blessings that led me to where I am today amen, amen. praise God bless you huh? amen. any others
Well, I mean, I know it's not the, bright, the happiest topic right now, but I'm thankful for snow. <laughs> because when we got all the snow previously, we were all sick. So Brody never got to play in it. And this is his first remember snow, I guess is the way to phrase it. Uh, so we got to go play in the snow yesterday, and um, we all survived. So that was it. <laughs> uh, I'm thankful for him the simple blessings of, of watching death cries as, as little toddlers slide down slides in the piles of snow. So it, it really is a, a blessing to be able to enjoy that. All right, before we move on, um, I do have one announcement that I forgot. Uh, confirmation. If your child is interested in going through confirmation, uh, please let me know. If, if we have folks that are interested, I'll start it up in a couple weeks. Uh, the, my plan is to do it Wednesdays at 6 so that the kids that are part of the Wednesday evening can do it as well. Um, it's one of those things that traditionally your, your kid's been around 13 or 14 years old. If they are younger than that and want to go through confirmation, come talk to me because ultimately I'm the one that makes that decision. So be in conversation with your children. If that's something they wanna do, uh, come and talk to me and, and we'll, get that, we'll get that ball rolling. Yes, older, thank you. Older folks can be in there as well. There is no age limit on confirmation. So if you are interested in joining the church, if you are interested in being baptized, if, you, if your membership still technically lies in the church you know, that you grow up in, however many years that might have been away and you would like to join this church, all that is included in confirmation. So, so come and talk to me with, with any questions. Oh, yeah. Amen. Amen. God loves that little kitty. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, you did want to get in there, but it's fun watching them. Our dog still loves the snow too, so I understand, Bob. All right, I'm going to invite John, and he's going to come up and read a psalm for us this morning. Oh, you got it. Okay. I don't think there's a, a biblical verse that's more appropriate than for the, the turmoil the world is going through right now than the one I'd like to share with you this morning. And it's Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance me and devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. The war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me, and his sacred tent I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says to you, seek this face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, 
the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident on this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Well, now we're going to be blessed by the Alleluia Choir. Um, before we get started, I wanted to announce that Adeline Shreve is going to have our um, scripture verse. She just knew, found out on Wednesday that she was going to do this, and she doesn't know how to read yet, so this is truly amazing that she's going to do this. Be kind to one another, Ephesians 4.32. tell you a story. Go up there with the rest of me. Go sit down. Brody. Top of the morning to you, lads and lasses. How are you today? Do you know I'm talking to you like that? Well, there's a little holiday that's coming up this week that sometimes we celebrate. What is it? It is at St. Patrick's Day. Do you guys know anything about St. Patrick's Day? What do you do? What do you have to wear? Green. You have to wear green, and if you don't wear green, somebody's going to do what? They're going to pinch you. Um, what else is another symbol you might see at St. Patrick's Day? A clover. A four-leaf clover. Sometimes we call him a shamrock. Um, what's that little guy that plays tricks? A leprechaun. Sometimes people say the leprechaun's going to play tricks on you. Well, I wanted to talk to you. Did you know that St. Patrick was a real person? 
He was, he was a real person. And as a little boy, he was kidnapped and um, taken to Ireland and he escaped and um, went back home to England. But the Lord laid it on his heart to go back to Ireland and to help bring them to Christianity. And one of the things that he used to do that was the symbol that you guys have mentioned. He used a, he used a clover with three leaves. And he did this to um, give them a symbol of the Trinity. Do you guys know what the Trinity is? It represents the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And so he just felt that it was important to teach them about Jesus. And that reminded me of a Bible verse, Mark 16, 15. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. So that's what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to tell our friends about Jesus and tell people that don't know about Jesus about him. And we can do that by talking to him or to others. Um, but another thing that we can do is um, by our actions. When we do nice things and we're polite and we help others and we show them love, um, that's how we can show Jesus' love. So this week, when you're wearing your green, um, maybe you could talk or show someone about Jesus. Yes. Are you? Cool. That is so awesome. That'll be so fun. Are you? You guys have lots of big trips, so you have lots of opportunities to show other people about Jesus, right? All right. Can we say a little prayer? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and to learn about you. We pray that when we are presented the opportunity to tell others about you, that we can tell them and show them your love. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Priorities, got to get the candy. As we come now for our time for prayer concerns, <coughs> excuse me, who should we be praying for this morning? Continue to pray for Patty. I have a friend, and as you know, I can only talk to her through social medias like Snapchat, and I get a picture, and all I really see is a hospital bed. So as you know, it kind of freaked me out a little bit. Luckily, it wasn't her, but it, her grandma. Something happened. I don't know all the details, but I would just like you to keep her in your prayers, please. If you all could pray for Ken Kreger, um, he has an infection and he is um, in congestive heart failure and is retaining a lot of fluid. He's home, but he really could use any prayers that we can give him. Yeah, I'd like to ask for continued prayers for Chick Farrell. She had her third stint put in Friday and everything went well. But she is asking for prayers. Thank you. Any others? Georgia and her, her brother Bill, Bill 
banks passed away and were sick to April and having a really hard time grieving. And she's got a couple of friends down in Florida. I can't remember the last name, the first name was Gloria and Howard. And Howard uh, has uh, brain cancer that's pretty bad. And things are rough all over and they can use some prayer. Now to spread. Any others? This uh, I meant to share during the praise, but a friend of mine that I work with, his daughter is going to be baptized next week. So if you miss Chris and I, our plan is to go down to watch her be baptized. So, Amen. So that's awesome. I meant to share, share that during the praise. Amen. There are no others. Would you pray with me this morning? <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the time that we have, that we are able to come and speak with you this morning. First of all, Father, we give you praise. We give you thanks, Lord, that we are able to gather together, that we are able to offer ourselves as an offering of praise this morning. Whether we are here today and you gave us safe troubles or travels, or whether we are gathered together in our homes or wherever we might be, joining online. We just give you thanks for that blessing that we are able to come together and worship together this morning. Father, for all these that have been lifted up, for those who are in need of healing, for those who are recovering, and for the plethora of those that have gone unspoken, Heavenly Father. You know each situation. You know what is needed in each one. So we just pray, Lord, that you would open wide your floodgates, that your blessings and your mercies would pour out upon all those that we lift, both spoken and unspoken to you. Father, we just anticipate and know that good things will happen and that you will bless your people. And we take this time and we lift these prayers as we pray the prayer in which you taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will those helping with the offering please come forth? We give you thanks for these gifts. We ask your blessing upon these gifts that they might be used for the building up of your kingdom, Heavenly Father, that lives might be touched for their betterment because of these offerings. Both these offerings of funds, Lord, and the offerings of ourselves and our presence and our work. We give you thanks, and we ask your blessing upon all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're going to turn things over to the choir. Thank you. 
I invite you to stand as we sing our hymn, Softly and Tenderly, 348. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Thank you. 
Well, this morning as I was reading through the different scriptures, I was ruminating on coming to understand exactly who, who God is and what God's desire is for us. And I was trying to look at, there are innumerable different scriptures that I can bring that out from. And as I looked into the lectionary, there were a few ideas. And it's one of those things that I prayed for because the, the original scriptures that light God laid down before me this morning, shall I say they aren't my favorite. They're not the ones I would, I would immediately turn to. I'm much more comfortable to reach into the book of Romans or something like that. Something that I've heard a lot before. But God gave me these scriptures out of Genesis and then into the book of Luke. And it was one of those that he would speak and I would listen and I would go, are you sure, Lord? <laughs> but I trust him. So we're going to begin by looking at some of what Abram and Sarai go through so that they might understand who God is and what God is doing in their lives. Now, as we meet them, we're going to find them... Uh, in a different situation, but so far they have been called and answered that call. And it's a very specific call because God calls to Abram and says, I want you to go this way. In fact, that's pretty much the only direction he got. You're going to go this way and I'm going to take you to a land. <clears throat> that's a big thing because it wasn't just leaving behind family. It was believe, leaving behind your safety net. Because your family is where everything was. It was a generational kind of survival at this point in time. <clears throat> but they answer. And they live, leave behind family and go where God is instructed. And <clears throat> now this is after they've come through Egypt. Which every time Abram goes to Egypt, it is, it is not his best moments. He does not always trust quite the way we think he should. Uh, his, his poor wife, if you don't know that story, just... Just when you get into Abram and Sarah, go to Egypt, any, any heading, just go, oh, his poor wife. <clears throat> so they, they've made it through. They've defeated kings. They've rescued Lot. They've been blessed by Melchizedek, who we're still trying to figure out who is. <clears throat> and then we meet them here. And it's one of these times where God is going to have this special moment where he has conversation with God, but it doesn't go quite the way we think it should. And we're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 15, the first 18 verses. And it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted to him his righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they shall serve. And afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. 
And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to come into your house this morning. Whether that might be we are here in present or we are out there in Facebook land. Together, Lord, we are joining together in spirit and truth to worship you. As we have come and offered ourselves as willing sacrifices, we just ask, Lord, that you would speak to us, that your spirit would minister to us, and that through those ministrations, Lord, that we would be drawn closer to you like never before. I pray, Lord, that you would speak through me, Lord, that this would not be my message, but your message for your people, that we might be transformed by your glory for your outreach into this world so that all might hear the good news and none might be lost. I pray in all things now, Lord, that you take me and hide me behind your cross, that this is your word alone, for your glory alone, for the transformation of all of your people. And I lift this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And all men. One of the first things I come to understand when I read this scripture is that God is not so big and so great and so somewhere else that we are unable to not only talk, but question. God has brought Abram through all these different challenges. He's, he's brought him through Egypt. And, and let's be honest, if you don't know the story, Abram was so afraid that his wife was so pretty that when they got to Egypt, that everybody was just going to kill him so they could take her. So he asked his wife to pretend to be his sister. And uh, let's just say lots of entertaining things happen. Um, you know, the patience of a wife is really shown in Sarai because he doesn't just do it once, he does it twice. Um, he, his, his nephew is kidnapped. God gives him the ability to overcome. They, there's been all these times where Abram has been able to witness the strength and power and ability of God. And God pulls him aside for this special blessing, this little intimate conversation. He goes, I am your shield. I am your strength. And I am going to bless you in ways you'll never even imagine. And he goes, that's great, God. But I am old and I don't have a kid. What blessing can I ask for when my line ends with me? My descendant is going to have to be a man of my household. Now, that's a nice way of translating that. He literally says, my descendant is going to have to be a slave. I'm going to have to choose the head of my household, which would be a slave, and name him as my firstborn. How are you blessing me? Might be a way that, he's, that he might say this. But Lord, you know, there was all the trouble in Egypt. There was all the trouble with Lot. What exactly is going on? And you tell me it's all going to be okay, that, that, it's, that my, my, my descendants are going to outnumber the stars, but I'm old, Sarah's getting up there, and I don't even have an heir. So you just tell me, Lord, how it's going to be okay. And God answers in a way that seems incredibly cryptic to us. But first, what I love about Abram is, is that he trusts God enough to question him. Abram knows who God is at this point in time. He knows he's the author of all creation. He's, he's witnessed to the power of God, and yet he looks at God and goes, I just don't get you. That's a prayer that I've said on several times in my life. I just don't understand it, Lord. But when he understands something is an aspect of, of God, and an understanding of God that goes from Genesis to Revelation. And that is that God is loving, merciful, and slow to anger. Over and over again, we see that from Genesis all the way through. God is loving, merciful, and slow to anger. But if we're honest with ourselves, when we think of the God of the Old Testament, 
Loving, merciful, and slow to anger is not how we might identify with everything we see in the Old Testament. But regardless of what we see, what we hear his people say over and over and over again is our God is loving, merciful, and slow to anger. So sometimes we have to pull back what we might think and look at the, what the people's message were, well, it was who were going through it all side by side with God. And the amazing thing is, is as they watched fire fall, as they watched their places be destroyed, as they watched over and over all these different things happen, their message about God was always, you are loving, you are merciful, and you are slow to anger. And God reveals this in a very unique way that looks so different from what we might understand. Because he, he looks at Abraham and just goes, how am I supposed to know this? How am I supposed to believe that my descendants are going to be <laughs> greater than the stars? And he goes, all right, go get all these animals. And don't just go get all these animals. Butcher them, cut them in half, spread them out on the grass. And we look at this and go, Ugh. what does this have to do with anything? And God begins to tell him about how everything's going to be okay. And he begins to root everything in these three aspects of God. Merciful, loving, and slow to anger. And I love this because it is constantly revealed. And we see the, the utmost of God revealed in the fullness of Christ. And if you ever want to know, is God loving and merciful and slow to anger, as the Bible says, then I ask you to find this. Find me a time where Jesus encountered a, a sinner of any kind... And encountered an angry God. The, the God that we portray God as, as a, lot, a lot of times. The one who's ready to smite. The one who's ready to throw down fire and burn us up because somehow we're not good, because we're not good enough. This angry God that we continually portray. Show me where we see that in Jesus. Because Jesus encountered every kind of individual of every kind of sin you name it he not only ministered to them he loved them he talked them and he treated like him his own because there was no sinner that ever met jesus and encountered an angry god what he found was a god who was loving merciful and slow to anger even when they were nailing him to a cross after he'd been tortured he was loving and he was merciful even though God was constantly rejected, even though we as his people continually fail God, God remains faithful. And that is ultimately revealed in Jesus Christ. And it starts in this weird little thing that happens out in the field with Abram. Because this is what covenant looked like long before we had these, these little pieces of paper where we could write down promises and sign our names to them. This is what covenant was. You took these, an, these animals and it was a type of offering, but it was literally making a deal in blood. When you split all these animals up and butchered all these animals up and killed all these animals, the symbol was, I will hold to this promise or let the same be done to me. But what we don't see is Abram walk through the blood to take on the promise. He never does it. What we do see is the image of God, the burning flame, go through. God not only makes the covenant, he says, I'll be the one that upholds it because you can't. I'm going to make a covenant with you that is impossible for you to uphold it. So I'm going to be the one that does and you're going to be the one who benefits from it. That's our God. That's the merciful, loving God that is revealed in Scripture. Because He constantly says, you, my people, are broken and injured and you don't even know it. And I'm going to work in such a way that heals and restores you. And you are unable to do it on your own. So I will do it for you because I love you. God's heart is witness to the most in Jesus Christ in these moments. And this is from Luke chapter 13. I want to give you one of the examples of this. Luke 13, picking up in verse 31. Now, Jesus has been teaching. He's, he's, he's been healing a woman. There's the, been the teaching on the mustard seed and the, how the door is narrow. 
And the response is, at that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, this isn't the Pharisees coming and warning him and going, Herod's after you, you need to get out of here. This is them saying, Get! Herod's going to kill you, and we're going to help. And his response isn't what we would expect. Because if, if, if somebody is told, hey, the king's trying to kill you, and we're going to let him know, the response generally is to get out of town. Jesus says, that's fine. You go tell that old fox exactly where I am. I'm going to be right here. I'm going to be ministering. And I don't even tell you where I'm going for the next three days. Because I don't fear Herod. Because I'm doing the will of my father. And then we get this interesting conversation of, but I will have to leave and I've got to go to Jerusalem because that's where the prophets are killed. And I could imagine the Pharisees going, wait, what? Does he know? Because they'd already been planning. We've got to get rid of him. And then in the middle of this discord, Jesus laments and it looks angry but I think it's more heartbroken. Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem. I have longed to gather you, my children, like a mother hen gathers her brood. And yet you have rejected me over and over and over again. There was a picture when the Australian fires were going on where they had discovered a mother hen who had stayed over top of her chicks and burned to death because of it, trying to save them. And that's the image that we see in Christ here is I would be willing to give anything and I am willing to give anything that I might be able to draw you in and save you. Even now the Lord cries out, come home children. And he offers not only the path, but a light to guide our way and opens the door for us. Jesus is the ultimate understanding that our God is merciful and loving and slow to anger. Because what we see is continually people don't understand who Jesus is and continually people rejected Jesus and yet continually Jesus loved them and reached out to them and did everything in his ability that they might be drawn in. That they might understand that they can find love. That they can find the forgiveness that their heart cries out for. All they have to do is come to Him. And even now, the Lord is still crying out that message to a hurt world that is struggling and trying everything to find and fulfill the longing of their hearts. Not understanding that that... That desire that they can't get fulfilled is found in God. Because we were created to be in communion with God. And I mean that communion that was found in Genesis when Adam and Eve walked side by side, face to face with God. That's what we were created to be in. But the brokenness of sin messed that up. Yet God made a way through Jesus Christ that it might be restored. What? What keeps us from answering the Lord's cry? Because his cry comes to those who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good just as much as to those who don't know. Come closer. Won't you know more about me? Won't, why, won't, why don't we have the conversations that we used to? I remember when you used to come to me at night worried and talk. Now you just sit and, and, and worry. 
I remember when you would delve into my word because you wanted to know more about me and I was able to speak to you about that. And now, well, I remember why won't you come back to me, my people? Have you gotten too busy? Have you gotten too distracted? The invitation as we go through this Lenten season, as we wander in the wilderness together, is to answer that call today. Listen to his voice and, and come home. And that looks different for all of us. But the ultimate invitation is this. Jesus is coming back one day. And I think the church has been focused on the wrong things when we hear that message. Because when we say Jesus is coming back, we have, we have taught it in such a way that it is you must hurry up so that you can avoid hell. Or you've got to hurry up because the Antichrist is going to be here. Or you've got to hurry up because the devil is, 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 is in his machinations doing his best to destroy the people of God. What if we instead said Jesus is coming back? Are you ready to join in the celebration? Jesus is coming back. We have Lent to get ready for Easter. And we have this life to get ready for the return of Christ. Are we using it? Or are we just going through the motions? Is today just another day until we can go back to work tomorrow? Is it just another day? Is it just another week? Is it just another year? Or are we getting ready for the greatest celebration of all when those clouds part and our Savior returns and this world is changed forever by it? Or are we just ready for the church service to be over so we can get to the buffet? Where are our priorities at? Are we really looking forward to Christ, Are we really bringing this into a, a, an aspect of our life, making it a priority, or is it just something else on the to-do list? Because what God says is, I will be all, or I will be nothing. I'm not your club. I'm not your hobby. I will be your God, or I will be nothing. And it's a message that we have stopped speaking because it's a struggle. It's a reality that we don't like to deal with is that God loves us. God is merciful. God is slow to anger, but God has also given ultimatums. He's not into playing games. I will be your God or I will be nothing. Don't dabble. Yeah, he says, come and taste and see. But that's not so. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll put my hand up. I might be the only one that ever does this. You ever go into Sam's Club when they're giving free samples? You find that one thing that. Mm, and you, you got to take your sample. And you go, that's really good. And you keep going. You go, man, that was good. And then you go down one freezer aisle. And you go back. And you go, I want to get a piece of this for my wife. Who's never going to see it. When he says taste and see, that's not what he's talking about. A grabbing a piece and walking away. And then come back and get another piece. And then he says, come and taste and see. Because when you really experience it, when you receive it, you'll go, there is nothing better than this. The scriptures give us images of I would willingly give up everything so that I can have this. The farmer who sells everything so that he can get to the field that has the treasure in it. That's what he's talking about. When you come and really taste, when you come experience, you'll give it all up just to meet God. Why did the early Christians go to the lion's dens, go to the funeral bars, singing hymns and rejoicing? Because they had tasted and seen that the Lord was good and they knew that nothing not even their lives was worth giving it up. Are we expressing that same sentiment? Or have we tried to treat our God like our social club? 
when I have time, I'll put the shirt on and I'll go do the things I need to do and then I'll go about the rest of my life. That's in Scripture. Unfortunately, it's not the Scripture we want it to be. Those are the people that when are gathered together, they say, Lord, we did all these things in your name. We said all these things. We performed all these miracles. And the Lord says, but I never knew you. I will be your God or I will be nothing. It's never in our work. It's never in our, we don't earn it. It's all in him. And he offers us something that is better than we can ever find. And the only thing he says, the only requirement there is, is would you receive it? The Lord is returning, brothers and sisters. Are you ready to join in, in that celebration? Heavenly Father, this morning, we come to you and I pray we come truthfully. And I pray that as we sing this closing hymn, that we might be honest with ourselves. If we've been playing games and calling it faith and religion, but we've never committed ourselves to you, then I pray that with clarity like we've never experienced, you would speak that to our hearts. And that today, today, Lord, we would come and give ourselves to you. That we might indeed taste and see that there's nothing better. Maybe we've wandered and we need to come back. You show us in the image of the prodigal son that you don't just welcome us back. You welcome us back with celebration and open arms. Father, you know every heart that is here, and I pray you simply speak to it. Be with us, O oh Lord. In Jesus we pray. Amen. As we come to our closing song, Great is thy faithfulness, page 377. The altar is open. If you would like to spend some time with God, won't you come? Won't you come? There's a little problem. What's that? Great is thy faithfulness. Is on Excuse me, 140. That's why we make sure to have the big thing up there. 277 is in the
as we pray. God, what a great day we have had here already. And as Nathan has expounded your word unto us, help us to understand that you said we have to be either hot or cold. If we're lukewarm, you'll spit us out. Forgive us, God, for being lukewarm so much of the time. Help us to be the people you know that we can be and that we truly want to be. Help us to devote our lives to you wholly, unconditionally, and do what it is you want us to do in our community, in our homes, in our church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Great God.